What's up YouTube? Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite and most misunderstood computers, the Grid Compass. The year's 1982 and if you want to take a computer with you, your options are an Osborne, it's about that big, a K-Pro, it's about that big, if you're a JPL NASA employee or you have six grand to spend, you can get one of these little Atrona Attaches and these are pretty cute, pretty powerful. Or if you want the absolute Ferrari, the highest end thing money can buy that meets the objective requirement of being able to fit in your cocaine-filled briefcase that you take to your three martini lunch, you had the grid compass. Let's talk a little bit about what this whole thing was about. So the year is 1979. We're in Mountain View, California. John Ellenby and a bunch of Xerox Park alumni are super inspired by Alan Kay's concept for the Dynabook, which was a portable information appliance used for education. So John Ellenby and his colleagues at Park come together and they decide to do one of the first Bay Area stealth mode startups. They're going to apply all this technology to actually build that concept. So they go on and they start to scope things out. And what they realize is in order to really achieve the idea of the Dynabook, this portable information appliance, they're going to have to go up market. To be able to fit this kind of power uh, and, and the power really needed to execute on their software plan uh, in an ergonomic form factor, they were going to need a lot of money. So what came out of this is they actually positioned the grid compass up market of what they really initially wanted to build because... Frankly, no one else could afford the price point needed to pack all that tech into a briefcase. What came together was ultimately a plan to market the ultimate computer for C-suite decision makers, the three martini lunch cocaine and an S-class crowd that put the compass squarely into the territory of Ferrari in terms of business intelligence appliances. So in 1982, they go on to release their first product, which is the Compass 1101. This was contemporary with the original IBM PC, but it featured an 8086 processor, which is the full 16-bit uh, Intel 8086, at twice the clock speed of the contemporary PC, uh, along with a built-in 1200-baud modem, which is an important feature for this machine that we'll come back to in a minute, uh, as well as a bitmap display, kind of like what we have on the Macintosh, and 384K of internal bubble memory, which was kind of used as a flash hard drive. Uh, and then also they package this up with a keyboard-driven multitasking operating system designed to empower even novice computer users to accomplish any office task that they can conceive of. A lot of people focus on the probably enduring innovation from the Grid Compass, which was that it was the first machine with a folding clamshell design. They had this crazy custom-engineered flat screen that they got from Sharp. They had to dump a lot of money into Sharp to get it built, and it folded over the keyboard, which is a form factor that the Grid was really first to have, but that endures to this day in the modern laptop. For a time, Grid even had a patent on this, but it was heavily challenged and ultimately invalidated uh, later on. This design is ultimately one of the famous points of Bill Mogridge, the late grid industrial designer's legacy, but we'll come back to him in a moment. Now, in addition to the ergonomics of the system itself, emphasis was put by grid on building an ecosystem around this. These are the disk systems you might have at home uh, to use as mass storage or as a floppy disk system, but when you were on the road, you would connect through that 1200 baud modem to a remote system, download your files, download your applications, switch them in and out, from the grid central cloud service over your 1200 baud modem and that was a fairly novel idea at the time building a thin and light laptop with solid state storage that was entirely cloud and deskless centric it's very similar to modern ultrabooks in that respect and just like the modern ultrabook the grid compass was built with heavy influence from intel the lowercase i in grid's name is actually a nod to them as they provided not only the chipset but also the IRMX runtime on which their operating system is based, many other aspects of the grid system. Unfortunately, grid's vision of a deskless, networked office of the future was misunderstood as much by potential customers as the enduring computer collectors who own grid systems today. One could even point to sexism as a potential contributor for the lack of Compass's adoption in the market, 
as in 80s executive culture, typing and information preparation work were viewed as secretarial in nature. It wouldn't be until PCs found wins with early individual contributors in the 1980s that personal computing trickled up into the C-suite. Ultimately, the grid found use not where the designers intended, but in less interesting industry verticals such as running the Space Shuttle portable onboard computer software and targeting missile systems for the U.S. government, as well as allegedly running communications on Air Force One, as well as the nuclear football. Basically, any place where a $20,000 laptop was seen as a bargain for a small portable computer was a win where it could run a bespoke task. So in time, this market grid leaned in on, and a couple years later, Grid was selling expensive MS-DOS PC clones for the system integration market, while many of the software design team building the original Compass story left. Today, the Grid is misremembered as, alternatively, a rugged system due to their popularity with the military, who is keen to adopt any fast, small, off-the-shelf computer. MS-DOS clones, based on Grid acquiescing to industry demand to run a second operating system, which was largely driven by Lotus 123, the breakthrough spreadsheet application or the world's first laptop, which does little to communicate product vision beyond form factor. Perhaps most irritatingly, many collectors covet the grid simply because it was the sentry gun computer from Aliens. Come on guys, it only showed up in the director's cut, and if you look hard enough, there's also Altos in there. Now this story does have a happy ending, which is that the grid's revolutionary industrial design, built by famed British industrial designer Bill Mogridge, went on to springboard Bill's career, and he went on to found the design firm IDEO and act as the director of the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York. He had a long and illustrious career um, and died a few years ago, which is unfortunate, but his contributions to modern computing and design are immeasurable. Over the years, I've managed to piece together and acquire the original grid operating system SDK, which is quite elusive given the fact that the mass storage system needed to run it is quite rare, and the software was only ever distributed electronically via the grid central cloud service, so you have to find a hard drive unit that actually has the pieces on it. Um, so we do have an SDK. We can actually write new grid applications now. That's kind of cool. Uh, eventually, Grid was sold to Tandy, and their Mountain View campus was sold to Sun, who paid a six-figure sum to demolish the enormous concrete Grid logo out front. Today, Facebook occupies that space. The Tandy Grid IP was then purchased by PC maker AST Research, before being acquired by AST's current owner, Samsung. So about that happy ending. Many of the original Grid staff eventually did get to build that information appliance for the masses that Alan Kay envisioned, and they did it successfully. But the story of Palm and the Palm Pilot, the first PDA arguably to check all the boxes, is for another day. Thanks for watching. Take care. If you are a computer history hype beast and you like what I do, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, leave a comment, or give me a follow on Instagram, T underscore R underscore zero underscore N. I hope I can keep you guys entertained during this annoying lockdown. Everyone take care. Have a good weekend.